Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Words About Books. I'm Ben. I'm here with my co-host, Nate. This is part two of our discussion of Christopher Moore's A Dirty Job. If you have not listened to it already, please go back and check out part one, where we talk about our history with this book, our initial impressions of this book, and how we felt on our second read. We also do a deep dive into some of the characters. And this episode, we're going to be focusing on the summary and the plot. So, so Nate, to kick this off, why don't you tell me about the Morrigan? All right, perfect. So we're getting into the beat. The summary, Ben. The new meat. <laughs> yeah, new meat. That's what they call him. And they say hurtful things to him from the storm sewer. And uh, at some point in the book, very early on, he gets a swanky sword cane. And uh, yeah, he they start out as like flat shadows, basically. But they move. Ooh, and like... He, he puts down a soul that's inside of some sort of doll or something, and they're like, give it to us, and, and their arms come out, but he takes out a sword cane, and he hits them, and, and that hurts them, and then he starts throwing M80 firecrackers down there, and that makes them stronger, is the impression no. I got? Because they become more three-dimensional, and more, like, they start growing back their wings, and... Like that makes them stronger, but no, later it doesn't. On, it doesn't make them stronger. What happened? Well, I think they're collecting souls. The, collecting souls is the only thing that makes them stronger. I think the M80s do damage them, but the confusing part is after he throws the M80s, they realize that he doesn't know something. Yeah, what and was I, that, Ben? I forget. We need to go talk to Orcus. He doesn't know. And I don't think we ever know what he doesn't know. I mean, there's just like, there's a warehouse of shit he doesn't know. Because they got stronger somehow. Yeah. Yeah. So I that's why I was like, did the M80? Like, that doesn't make sense if the M80s made them stronger. Because later on, they will be blown to fucking bits by claymore mines i understand you would like to know more about the lore of the world and the story that's going on but let me take a moment to tell you the good news about fuck puppets oh my god do you want to talk about that then <laughs> the misogyny gets to be a little bit much <laughs> it gets to be a lot much especially when you keep talking about fucking beta males I and it makes yeah. me just think you're a fucking gross incel man. So here's the thing: like incels weren't really a thing yet, and I don't think he means beta male quite the way they like red pilled alpha fucks, beta bucks type stuff. I, I don't think he's like that deep into it. But man, like the kernel of its beginnings is there, and it and the microwave yeah. is on because yeah. because the the part where they move from. I'm just a little guy. I'm just a little guy and I'm scared and I'm a beta starts to like slowly turn into a big like a resentment of women as as the book goes on. Yeah, Charlie just needs to get laid, Ben. That's that's his real problem. Is look, he doesn't have enough sex. Look, the Charlie needs to get laid thing, that's not what I have a problem with. No. I, I have a the, problem with the fuck puppets. That was my big problem, too. Uh, let's talk about that and then go back to the Morrigan. Ray and Charlie, they both think that they're they're serial killers, right? Which is because funny. Charlie keeps, yeah, Charlie keeps getting stuff from the recently deceased at his store because he is a death salesman. And Ray is meeting a bunch of Filipino women who he never comes back with and might also be men, and so maybe he's killing them, I guess. Yeah, each of them is a sad little man with a secret, and they yeah. suspect one another of being ser serial killers, and that is funny, because that is a thing that evolved naturally from the story. It, it is totally understandable why they would think that about each other, because they're both paranoid, imaginative losers with nothing but time on their hands. Yes, yes. Oh, and Charlie keeps asking Ray, like, hey, use your use your contacts to look up where this woman or this guy is. And then that person always ends up dead, like, a week or so later. And Ray's like, they're not, like, murdered every time or whatever. And Charlie's never seen around them, but, like, 
it's really weird that he keeps asking about people who are who then show up dead. But yeah, they they're going to go they're going to spend some time together to watch the other person and and see like maybe I can I can see if they're staking out a target or something. Let's go to the gym. And Ben, what do they see at the gym? They go to the gym and they hop on like a, a treadmill or something. And in front of them is a line of very attractive women. And Charlie asks if they are trophy wives. And Ray responds that they are fuck puppets. And Charlie asks what the difference is. And the difference is essentially that these are kept women. They're in like a sugar daddy type relationship. Yeah, they're they're trophy mistresses. Yeah, they don't marry the men. They just have an arrangement with them and they they will be discarded once they're all used up. Yeah. Once their looks fade away, they're just going to be tossed aside for the next hot one. And their entire existence is, I'm going to spend ex- a bunch of money on you so you can get cosmetic surgery. And then you're going to go to the gym to work out and tone yourself so that I can use your body for sex. Yeah. Unlike Ray, who was tossed aside by life at the moment of his sad, useless birth. <laughs> The, the the whole thing, and they will keep referring to these women as fuck puppets. So yes. one of the one of the women dies, right? And she's one of the people that Charlie has to collect a soul from. Now, and he still thinks of her as a fuck puppet. Yeah, he doesn't feel bad about her. There's no hospice nurse here, right? This is right. somebody who just like it's funny that they died. And and also, she is dug up by the Morrigan because Charlie can't get her soul because her soul is trapped in her. Uh, fake breasts so Charlie can't get those and the Morrigan get it and they dig up her corpse and desecrate it and uh, they start making they start making an actual puppet uh, they, they they make it the head talk and, and it's funny and it's still referred to by the narrator as a fuck puppet yeah implying and it's kind of a bit mean spirited if I say so Bad. It's it's very mean spirited and and like the implication being that Ray wants nothing more than an opportunity to sleep with women like this, but he is denied that because the alpha they they all want Chad, except they yeah. don't want Chad. They want money. why can't why can't <laughs> they just like a, a nice guy, Ben? I'm a nice guy. I'm a nice guy who refers to women as fuck puppets. Why don't they like me? It might be that you're actually not as nice as you think you are. And also being a nice guy, that's the bare minimum, buddy. That's Why the can't bare they just minimum. Settle down with a disability scammer like me who spends all day looking at porn in public. Yeah, and I can't turn my head to the right. So you know I can do some freaky stuff in bed. It's the fuck puppet thing. So that was one where, where Christopher Moore obviously had an observation that their their mistresses exist. Did you know that? I I didn't until I read this book, Ben. Did you know I'm that some rich men some, some rich it. men and possibly since the dawn of time have mistresses oh whom my God. they pay for the pleasure of their company? Did you know that? I I did not until I read this book. And and did you know that society perhaps does not think highly of that practice, but disproportionately places the blame for it on the women and not the men who pay them? Yeah, I had a friend who I don't talk to anymore. If you're listening <laughs> to this, go fuck yourself. Who, who was upset because uh, he was watching girl streamers who they take advantage of men. And I don't know <laughs> if he said like him, but it was very heavily implied <laughs> <laughs> that you buy them gifts, and then they don't have sex with you. Yeah, that wasn't on the menu. Yeah, I mean, jeez. I I watched your stream, I bought you a gift, and you're taking advantage of me. And I was like, you could just not buy them gifts then, if you know exactly what's going on. Duh, you have a choice. But it's not her fault that you bought her a gift. 
you idiot. And uh, there was a video. I don't think he was in the video, but it was a... I don't want to shout out because they are actually... They were, I should say, not are. They were popular on YouTube. I'm going to say five to seven years ago because they had a humongous falling out with all their members and they fell apart and i'm okay with that uh and one of them was about girl streamers if they were being honest and it's all (laughs) this fucking bullshit over again and it's like you know it it clearly works on people like you you you're going into this knowing that they're there to play a game, look attractive on a camera, and you'll give them gifts. I I would offer the observation that it should not surprise you that people who appear on camera for a living put effort into their appearance. It is one of the reasons actors tend to have unattainable physiques. It is literally their job to look good. Because people want to pay to look at them because they look good. Yeah, but those are those are just a bunch of bad boy assholes, and that's all women want. Why don't they like good guys like me, nice guys like me? You're you're kind of weird, and you kind of put like all these weird conditions on uh, your relationship that you and you have yeah, you have nothing it's to like offer. Maybe if that's how you think about women, you might be putting an energy out there that makes them you know not go for you. Maybe maybe they're picking up this weird, I only look at you as something that will fuck me, energy. A fuck so, puppet, perhaps. Yeah, let's go back to the Morrigan. Yeah, <laughs> we went down a rabbit hole. Now let's go down a sewer drain. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm going to have to cut a lot of that. But it, it comes back, because like from the fuck puppet thing, this is when we start sexualizing the Morrigan. Yeah, one of them Charlie. And yeah, that, like, literally. As soon as, as soon, yeah, as soon as you finish, I'm gonna ram my claw through your brain. But she gets shot several times by a police detective who's following him, who appeared in other Christopher Moore books. Yeah. So she's forced to run away. So initially, when I was reading this, I was complaining to you about the beta male thing. And you thought I was being a bit dramatic, and then as you read it, you were like, shit, this does go on forever. <laughs> you are you are a hundred percent right. I'm <laughs> sorry I ever doubted you. <laughs> and then I thought, okay, two thousand six beta male, you know. He's he's not talking about the same incel stuff. He's not talking about incel stuff. Then Lily, fast forward four years, I have no idea what time it is in the book ever. You the have only to clue... go by Sophie's age. Because yeah, Sophie, nobody tells me Sophie Sophie's fucking age. age. Yeah. You know what they She's do tell me? six by the sh- end of it. So six, six years go by. Babe. Six by the end of it. Okay. Do you have the text or do you have the Kindle? I have the Kindle because I have Can you do a quick book. search for me and find out? This is, this is towards the end when he's talking to the lady. He says something like, I haven't had sex in 14 years. Just just search the, for the text, I haven't had sex. No results found? Search for the text, sex. Here it is. Um, all right, let's see. Who says this? Charlie, I feel very close to you right now and connected to you. Okay, I think this is her who said I haven't had sex in 14 years. Oh, okay. Yeah, because she said I'd rather face one of your raven monsters and go to bed with a man. But okay. now I'm here with you. I'm as sure as I've ever been. You're my soulmate. I love you. We'll get to that one. Because, yeah, you don't uh, have a soul. You can't have a soulmate. There, so, there's um, a reason. No, no. I mean, there's a reason why we haven't mentioned this character yet. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. So, yeah. So, Sophie's six by the end. Okay. So, that means if Sophie's six by the end, that means Lily is 22. Yes. Possibly 23. Depending so on at the some point of the year, but yeah, we find out that Ray has been breaking the rule of selling only one soul item per customer. Wow, that mm-hmm. is really messed up, Ben. How does Charlie figure this out? What does he go and find Ray just chilling out in a room on his own? Lily has decided in some bizarre thing that bothered me even when I was young that she is willing 
to have sex with Charlie because Charlie needs to get laid. Running theme. Charlie declines. Good move, Charlie. Yes. Um, thank you. Yes. He's like, you're like a sister to me. And, and also, but, eh, she's your but, employee. Yeah. But, <laughs> and you've known her for years. But he does say, and don't believe me, it's 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 not like it's not tempting. It's like, eh, eh, it's, eh. Is maybe that... maybe he was being nice. You could give him the benefit of the doubt. Like I, I'm I'm not rejecting you because it's really tempting. But like nah, I I couldn't possibly. That's how I read that. Uh, uh, that's not how I read it because I I have a sneaking suspicion that this is more of the common knowledge that younger women are hot. Editor Ben here. If it wasn't clear, there's I, I'm doing air quotes around this common knowledge stuff. I what I what I meant to say is I believe that this is more of what Christopher Moore thinks the common knowledge that every reader is going to have going into this. I, I did not mean to imply that it was in fact common knowledge. I disagree with these statements and I'm saying them sarcastically. Oh boy, this episode. Okay. And that every guy w- wants to get with, you know, high school or college girls Uh, and yeah no i i really do i really do think that i i think that lily is meant to be genuinely tempting god damn it editor ben again i i really do think that christopher moore thinks that yeah i don't feel like i chose my words very well in this particular part of the episode and (sighs) this episode Mm, i don't like that I don't like no, that. No, I don't like that either. And but but I do think that's what he means. Is like he finds Lily very very sexually attractive, but he he doesn't feel right about it. Which okay, complicated feelings. You can't necessarily control sexual attractivity, but you can control your actions. Good for you, Charlie. You declined. But Ray doesn't. And that kind of nope. makes me think that for some reason Lily Lily is painted as being a bit off. She's a bit weird. She skips school all the time. Her parents don't seem to be present or care. And uh, like the truant officer is showing up and and Charlie's covering for her and like, don't do that. And so Lily's desire to have sex with all these older men, like just to have sex, it would seem is um, maybe indicative of a problem. Like some sort of, abuse or neglect problem that she had in yeah, her childhood. She, she has some need for validation and she's looking for it in the wrong places. And it it's even kind of hinted that the thing with Ray was actually like she she winds up having sex with Ray to get him to confess. But And Charlie I doubt walks that's in on why. it and they have a conversation while she continues to hump him. It's meant to be funny. Um and it's but it's I've actually done... just kind of kind of weird. It's very weird. Yes. You're seeing your your much older male employee have sex with your much younger female employee who have known each other for years. It's even before she was an adult. It's very strange. But then she then she implies she regrets it. And oh, it she heavily worse. implied that she regretted it and said she would never do it again. Yeah. Fire Ray. Yeah. Evict him? Yeah. Like, there's a couple of things that the book tries to normalize that, like, I, as an adult, it, I guess I was an adult when I read it the first time, but like. You were a young, stupid adult. <laughs> I was yeah. also a young, stupid adult. I didn't, I sure as shit didn't feel like I was an adult at age 18. So, no. even though I was a legal adult. But Ray, Ray's a bad man. Yes. Yes, and, he is. And like it not in a funny way. He's not like comically stupid. He he's an incel. We yeah. we call him a beta male and that's haha funny funny, but uh, no, he's like the kind of incel that like you want to watch out for. Yes. And he actually could become a serial killer. Yeah. And Everybody is just taking opioids just all the time in this book. <laughs> Very casually. Everybody is stealing medication from the dying people. Or they're getting prescribed it, even though they, they don't need literally it. steal it from the people often. There's a whole conversation about how she'll get more. I thought the nurse gave Charlie medicine he didn't need, though. 
Yeah, I remember that so, properly. No, Jane gives Charlie medicine he, he doesn't need. Yeah. The nurse gives Charlie medicine he doesn't need. Yeah. Uh, Charlie yeah, visits opioids don't work that family way. who steals the medication from their dying mother. And then... Uh, that shit does get checked. I mean, it, it, it might be funny when my grandmother does it to uh, maybe accidentally poison my grandfather. But, like, it's not so funny when the family does it. It's just weird. It, it, it's just weird how everybody takes these pills. And how it mixes with the grief message, because so much of the grief message is, is like talking about uh, like the pain and moving on and the, the hard reality of watching somebody die and, ex- and experience dementia and stuff like that. And but you then know what would adv- make that better? If you got pills. Crunk. Yeah, so the thing is, though, he he actually does mix those messages. Like, he talks about how the one guy is offered drugs and refuses them, and Charlie is just like, you should take the pills, stupid. And it's like, Charlie, that's... I'm beginning to question if I should take your advice about death. (laughs) Because you you don't really seem to have a lock on it. If you can't experience grief without uh, popping morphine, then you're not really experiencing grief you're um you're avoiding it by taking medication and then when the medication wears off the grief's going to be there and you're going to take more medication and then you're you're going to be featured on a, a documentary about the the family that uh, controls the the opioid production and on amazon in 20 years Yay! <laughs> I'm like I don't I don't even know how to respond. You're not you're 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 spot on, Ben. You just... <laughs> <laughs> like woo woo hoo! I love uh, I love the the sweet sweet release that I get when I use morphine that I don't need. I actually I actually am not a fan of hydrocodone because. I took it and it helped with the pain and I wanted to like vomit and die. So I would end up just like, I'm going to lay down on the couch for a few hours now because otherwise I'm going to be throwing up and dizzy and like falling. Well, I think the problem is that the book just presents itself like it is giving you, it's it's giving you the real stuff. It's not giving you the, the platitudes. It's not giving you the sorry for your loss. It's going to tell you the truth about death and dying and grief. I'd be but, concerned if Christopher Moore was hanging out with dead people and getting, uh, or dying people, I should say, and getting a hit off of their morphine. I'm going to guess that's that's been his reality. Because, like I said, those moments are the experience. I guess it is like, California. Ha <laughs> oh, They've got a real real big problem but that's the that's the problem with the drastic tone shift is this jokey joke stuff serious message about death and dying i, I don't know I, I i i waffle on it you get to pick the next thing we talk about because i'm just going all over the place yeah yeah uh there there has been a lot of uh god okay what else so the the morrigan is there anything more we want to talk about them they get hit by cars at some point they get blown up by claymores. They get shot with guns. A dog attacks them. I guess we could talk about the devil dogs. So there is... The so we never mentioned or- Orcus? Or- Fuck, we did. We did mention Orcus. We, we briefly mentioned him as he's the big bad who doesn't get his shit ruined all the time. And, uh... Yeah. He's... he's married to the Morrigan. He's gonna be the next death. The Luminatus with a capital D. And, um, he... Fuck, where was I going with this? The Morrigan get their shit ruined. I don't know where I'm going with this, Ben. Oh, yeah, no, no. So they see Sophie is... She pointed at a woman in the park and said, Kitty, and the woman fell over dead. The Morrigan saw that, and they're like, Orcus, uh what the fuck and he was like oh my god that's that's disturbing you gotta kill this child and so the morrigan one of them sneaks into the house at night flat as a shadow she 
makes her way up to Sophie's room. She sees the sleeping child. She's got her, her bladed hand ready to go. It's really weird. She can't see into the corners of the room. That's fine. So she's going to kill this two or three year old. I can't remember. And then <laughs> uh, she gets grabbed by some sort of teeth by her ankle. She gets slammed into every piece of furniture in the room, chewed to shit and thrown out of a window. Um, and yeah, it, it, the next day, Charlie wakes up and is like, holy fuck. There are dogs the size of small cars in my house, two of them next to my daughter, and he's afraid that they're going to eat her, but instead, they seem to be protecting her, and they're named Alvin and Mohammed. And the dogs are immune to everything, and they eat anything you give to them. He starts giving them, like, poison or bubbles or whatever, and... Uh, they just eat it and and ask for more. I like the dogs. I I don't know. Yeah, I like the dogs. the The dogs are the best part. Probably the the whole best part of the entire book. Probably the funniest thing is a uh, bummer. <laughs> the Emperor's Terrier becoming a hellhound yeah. at the end. <laughs> Do you want to talk about the Emperor Ben? The Emperor is a recurring character in all of the Christopher Moore San Francisco books. He he's based, based on, on a real okay. guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's based on a real guy who apparently went insane one day and decided he was the Emperor of San Francisco and protector of like New Mexico or something. And uh, it's unclear if he genuinely believed this or if he had just gotten Lost sick his fucking of... fucking mind? Mm, I think... There's some speculation that the, it was an act, like the dude just enjoyed it. Yeah, maybe. And he, I don't know. I mean, either way, there's something going on there. He, he wasn't quite right, obviously, but... Well, he, he, I think he was homeless because he couldn't afford to fucking live in San Francisco even back then. Yeah. Ah. I think he went. I think he was a businessman who went bankrupt. Ah. In the Christopher Moore books, everybody knows the Emperor. Everybody indulges him. And... He's a genuinely good guy who, because he is crazy, is able to perceive the paranormal. And I like the Emperor. The Emperor is a good dude. Yeah. Emperor is easily the best part of these books. But the problem with the books, and I'm going to guess this is, if I go back, this is probably going to be an issue with all of them. There is a lot that this book tantalizes you with. Like, for example, Sophie in general. Sophie is obviously the reincarnation of the Grim Reaper. She what? Has all the how she, she ben, has the how dog. could you have possibly known that? Charlie kept saying it was him. It's are on the you, cover. Are you saying the yeah, are you saying the little girl who's on the cover as death and can kill people with a word and has two devil dogs protecting her is the Luminatus? I can't believe you would even put two and two together to get four, Ben. So you keep wanting the book at least i do I, I i keep wanting it to talk about the urban fantasy that it is ostensibly supposed to be but it never gets there we spend all these times going into diversions about beta males and venting fire and the nature of mistresses and hand the jobs nature and of Lily, mistresses. Lily being Philosophy a goth. Philosophy 102, and, the nature yeah. of mistresses intro. And I just, like, he never gets around to explaining any of the soul shit. I'm, I find it shocking that he has read two whole books on Tibetan death practice because, like, it would be better if you hadn't. Like, I think it would just be better if you didn't base it on anything and just made it up, because that's essentially what you're doing anyway. What? There's, this isn't there's... what the Buddhists really believe? The Tibetan monks, I mean? The, those I'm people? Gonna... <laughs> those people over there? Are you trying to tell would me you... that they don't eat whatever walks across their path and also... Uh, well, they're that... vegetarians, but would you... Yeah, I know they are. Would you... <laughs> Do you have a problem with me sprinting to the end? What, Ben? You don't love this summary that we're 
we've got going on. Okay, let me let me let me give you a brief outline for everyone. All right, Charlie figures out he's a death merchant. He he starts to figure out what that means. And then You're really got, going all the way back. He's got to collect souls. Every time he collects a soul, it's a little aside, and then some stuff happens with the detective, and then he collects another soul, and there's another aside, and then there's some beta male stuff, more detective stuff. It, it goes like that forever. And mm-hmm. not a whole lot happens. So that's why yeah, we're not we... going into an in-depth summary, because we would just be telling you, and then he goes into this house to find this person's soul, and uh, now now he gets that person's soul, and oh, now his mom is dying, so he experiences it firsthand. See, see that? And there was a death merchant who he got to fantasize about his sister, uh, and, and he told his sister that, like, yeah, every time he's gonna have sexual fantasies, you're gonna be in them, given... Uh, doing a threesome with uh, another hot girl, am I right? And she's like, you don't find that, like, gross and weird? And he's like, no. But yeah, let's talk about the la- like the actual plot which occurs in the last uh, 50 or so pages of the book. A cool, yeah, I was going to say, cool story, bro. So, <laughs> uh, in the last 50 pages, lest you think I'm exaggerating, of no. a 380-page book... The last 50 pages introduce the love interest, falls in love with the love interest, decides they're soulmates, they sleep introduces the once. main antagonist. <laughs> and then, yes, and then Orcus shows up right after that. <laughs> it's not a joke. We, we, we get... We get uh we get some interludes. We see Orcus, but Charlie doesn't see Orcus. He's gonna become the Luminous by gaining souls? Question mark. And then a bunch of other gods are gonna fight for it. And it's good. It's gonna be battle royale. But with souls. you're clouding this. You're you're clouding this with details like bullet points. Love interest introduced. Falls in love. Soulmate. She meets the kid. She loves the kid. Meets the main antagonist. It's Orcus. He wants to become death. Everybody's gonna become death. It's a big old battle. Uh, Minty Fresh is alive. Thought he was dead. Uh, Audrey, the love interest, makes squirrel people. She's been stealing the souls and putting them inside of uh, a mishmash of animal parts. And that's when the Chinese woman, she sees all of those and she's like, I'm going to be a vegetarian Again, from now on. Going into all the details. Yeah. Because <laughs> I said that earlier. I had to, I had to, I had to close that loop, Ben. Anyway. Oh, yeah. I'm sure everybody's <laughs> looking forward to it. And then, and then, and then, and then, <laughs> Charlie just fucking dies. That's the end. <laughs> ben, you you didn't go into the detail that uh, Charlie, he fights the Morrigan for the final time in the sewers on a ship. I don't know why that ship is there. And he he starts kicking their asses, but he gets poisoned, right? Like you said, he, he just fucking dies. But first, Orcus shows up. And uh, did you know, Ben, that Orcus, the demon king god or whatever the fuck he is, he's got one fatal weakness bullets <laughs> charlie just shoots him over and over and over again with a fucking magnum and then the morrigan come and finish evil. him off and that's the end of him yeah <laughs> but who cares because you didn't know what the morrigan was you didn't know what orcus was you don't care about any of this the more the more sophie comes in the sophie who, comes in she doesn't who, go with him she realizes she's the luminatus <laughs> she comes in kills them but charlie's already dead she waited until he was already dead to kill him because who the fuck cares oh that's a generous uh interpretation ben i thought she knew she was the luminatus and wanted to come with him and he wouldn't let her and then she decided that she needed to go <laughs> which <laughs> i don't know if that's better or worse so the main character falls in love, dies, like meets his love interest, falls in love, dies all within the span of the last 50 pages. Everything before the last 50 pages, fluff. Everything. <laughs> None you, of it are matters. Are you trying to say that the pacing of this book maybe isn't very good? Is that what... I'm that trying like to a- say <laughs> that this book is... Joke, joke, hospice story. Joke, joke, hospice story. Joke, joke, hospice story. 
last 50 pages tell the entire like plot of a book. <laughs> but you didn't like how he gradually came to understand that he was uh he was a death merchant and uh that No, that went on way too fucking long. <laughs> No, the first hundred pages of this book is this man failing to understand anything that's going on around him. The second hundred pages of this book is this man being like some kind of uh, sage genius slash sarcastic badass. Slash incel douche horrible asshole man. Yeah. I, needless to say, was shocked. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) By how how much I dislike this book rereading it. Yeah, and I I am actually like I dislike this book so much. Having reread it, I am now questioning <laughs> everything I read before the age of thirty. Did I like any of it? <laughs> this numbers among some of the worst books we've read. <laughs> And it was previously one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> this book is is more problematic than the Mortal Instruments. The, like, this book is way worse than the City of Bones in terms of sexual misconduct. Uh, yeah, I'll give you that one. <laughs> <laughs> I will it's, not it's, I will not apologize to Unsighted though, okay? And it's I will less never... funny. <laughs> it's probably less funny than the Bob thing. <laughs> oh god. It's just it's it's all snark and ironic detachment and masturbating to the glory that is San Francisco. But and San and Francisco, I totally, am I right? Oh, I totally get why clove cigarette smoking hipster Ben liked it. <laughs> Cause that guy's a fucking douche. <laughs> I disavow him. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I did from age I'm gonna say nineteen to twenty two. Oh, you're generous. I apologize. You're I apologize. Generous. I think anything uh age twenty five uh before age twenty five, that's when I broke up with my uh first major girlfriend. Uh, anything before that, just like uh, yeah, let's just not talk do you about know, it. Do you know what happened to me when I was twenty three? You got a real big boy job? No, I had no, I didn't. I'm oh. actually quite delayed because when I was 22 to 23. Oh, was that when you had your I, panic attack? I started having panic attacks and it got so bad that I actually like struggled to live my life. I had to get into like intense therapy and, and medication. And I think the bend that came out of that, uh, I no longer smoked clove cigarettes. And uh, <laughs> I, I think I had gotten over whatever it was that made me like this book. <laughs> I think the bend that came out of therapy just can no longer connect to this. So, which is to say, I grew up. I, I dealt with my problems, and I had I had real problems, and I I knew it wasn't you know cute anymore to do certain things that were just really really bad for you mentally. And uh, yeah, it just never put together that maybe. Maybe the person who wrote this book was a little broken, and maybe the people who like it are a little broken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Did we get everything we wanted to get? I think we got everything we wanted to get. I, I think do you, now Now we got to close it the way we started it. Yeah, let's go <laughs> over the rubric, Ben. <laughs> let's go over the post-read rubric. <laughs> All right, so I gave it 80 points Uh, (laughs) pre-read. I gave it 76 (laughs) pre-read. All right, content and ideas, Ben. (laughs) Oh, God. Okay, Uh, hang on just a second. I'm pulling up my calculator just so I can make sure I get the total right. Um, I don't want to have to remember things. Um, Okay, content and ideas. Uh, Landed on a three out of five. So my my explanation here is... There are ideas. There are original ideas. There are all ideas. of the. <laughs> uh, there, there aren't always. Let's let's be real. 
the there is a lot of original urban fantasy work that went on unfortunately christopher moore just wasn't interested in it and i was so (laughs) this is this is like a reverse of what we had with one of us is lying where i didn't think there were really any new ideas but it did the tropey stuff well this is a lot of new ideas none of it done well so on balance i think three out of five there's a lot of potential and it is a book that could have been saved with a sequel, but as I understand, even people that liked the first one don't like the oh, sequel. Oh, yeah, so. I saw a lot of negative reviews on the sequel, which was written in the last few years. Like, I'm guessing, though, that could well be people returning to it. I wouldn't be surprised. And having the same experience we're having. Like, I don't know that it's necessarily the book got worse. I think it's we all grew up. Well, some of the reviews did say, I don't know if this is exactly that. I don't know if the book is bad or if this is just like, I can't read Christopher Moore anymore. Okay, so what did you give it? I also gave it a three. Definitely there are clear ideas, clear plot points. Some of them, a lot of them are half-baked. They're undercooked. Okay, organization. This this involves pacing, <laughs> framing devices, narration. Yeah, so before I hit those last 50 pages, uh, I was like, maybe a three, because all the book is is like it's you're you're floating down a very lazy stream. Except in the last 50 pages, you run into the love interest, they fall deeply, madly in love. Uh, and then you find the main villain and he confronts them and dies and gets resurrected as a squirrel monster. The end. So I went with a two on this one. <laughs> because, I went with a two as well. Because I, I think that the, uh, getting to figure out that your death part, that would be fine. It should have been shorter, but it was like, oh, why didn't that guy see that guy? And then he got hit by a bus and da 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 da. It's like, oh, wow, weird shit's happening. He saw a guy that nobody saw in his wife's hospital room and then his wife died. What's going on? And then there's just a middle of the book that's just there. And six years go by and he never raises his daughter and his and then and then at the end he finds the second love of his life and he realizes life is worth living again and he this is the most amazing woman he's ever met even though he's literally spent maybe 24 hours and that's being generous with her some of that was being tied up and maced or tased i can't remember i think she was tased uh by it's, an old it's woman. almost not it's almost like i debated i have so many problems with her Nothing is right about her character. The entire backstory is wrong. It's a big old exposition dump of where she came from, who she is, why she's doing what she's doing. Do you want to go over doing. that after this rubric, Ben? Because I'd love to talk about her. We didn't even really mention her because she doesn't show up until the fucking end. I, I just feel like it's... Is it even worth getting into? Because just nothing is right. Yes. Yes, it is worth getting into, Ben. This is words about books, and when nothing is right, we will spend a long time talking about it. This is a good indication of the book, Ben. We're at the end, and we're like, oh, yeah, we forgot a major character. We got to talk about her. Well, like, the, the, the crux of her character is that she has these, like, ancient Tibetan Buddhist powers that she was given despite being, like, an objectively terrible buddhist nun yes and like also i don't think he knows that she would be called a nun he keeps calling her a monk and i know you read two books at least on on buddhism and they're nuns she doesn't join a monastery like you know that right no tibetan monasteries don't accept women why not ben and also, they don't give ancient texts that are away. buried in a mountain to outsiders. They, well, they don't give. They don't leave the temple. No one takes them. They don't. They're not just yours to keep. Unless and, and it's second, about a magical power that can keep you alive forever. And second, undeath is like the greatest sin in Buddhism you could possibly conceive. <laughs> Being undead is stuck, right? (laughs) You're stuck. It it is literally separating yourself from the cycle of death and rebirth, which is 
the goal of buddhism is nirvana is to do that and then it's just oh god it's it's all wrong it's all wrong <laughs> see this is why tibetan, you should have brought it up <laughs> tibetan buddhism is attractive because they have the book of the dead like new age people love the book of the dead and it is like so annoying it, it's just such a distraction from everything you're supposed to focus on but yeah but organization put, two out of five but she could put souls inside of uh little gremlin monsters she was also a theater major or something then nate 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 <laughs> there is no soul in buddhism <laughs> oh dear oh, that's the first oh, thing oh god i think they might have fucked this up then ben I... <laughs> that's like that's like the first thing buddha taught there is no one thing you can point to and say that's me you are an emergent property of several aggregates and is and she also does point out in the book that it's really weird that your soul would be attached to a material object there's no soul in buddhism well, there is in this one, Ben. <laughs> that's, that's, what is, what is, the, like, consciousness in, in Buddhism may continue on. But, like, there is a, like, one of the most commonly asked questions in Buddhism is, what gets reincarnated? Your breast implants. Because the first thing, the first thing he teaches is, no soul. Get rid of that shit. That's... <laughs> It's wrong. <laughs> like it, that this offended you on a uh, completely. <laughs> I that's why I didn't even want to get into it because it's so far off. Of like, <laughs> oh, there's there's a reason Tibetan Buddhism is more attractive to New Agey types because it's got more magic shit than most sects of Buddhism. There's more st like stuff that that feels like magic to a Westerner in tibetan buddhism than say like theravada buddhism i know a lot i, I like buddhism and, and which, which one of those forms of buddhism has the force <laughs> technically <laughs> technically all of them there's <laughs> there are, i'm not getting into this i'm not talking about this. <laughs> all right use we, of language. We're yeah we're, we're way too into this okay use use of language uh yeah, it's a three from me and I'm just going to read you what I wrote in my review. Um, I'm, I'm begrudgingly giving this a three, uh, but I wanted to go lower. I really don't like how all the characters have devolved into the same sarcastic zinner, zingers until it's time to be sad again. Like literally by the end of the book, what little characterization there was between the different speaking roles, everybody becomes the same person by the end. Yeah. Even fucking Sophie. The six-year-old is talking like a hipster douche by the end. <laughs> I I think I was a little more generous and maybe too much, so I did give it a four. You want to give it a four because it has a distinct style. It's got a distinct style. It does have heart, although... If I were rating either his book about the real lived experiences of hospice workers or... His 15-minute uh, stand-up set on open mic, I'd probably give his use of language a little bit more. But as a novel, it's shit. So it's a three, which is not shit. But like, this is what I say when it's like, I want to give it less. This is my this is my objective integrity that is giving it a three. Yeah, I went with the four. I think he had a s solid grasp of language, Ben. No, you're wrong. Okay, but, that's uh, fair. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a grasp of language. I mean, the man can can spin a, a a good sounding sentence, unlike myself. But he can't write a novel. He can't write this novel. This was too ambitious. The whole combining real life grief with comedy. He's not the guy. There are people who can do this. Not him. So this brings us to maybe the irrelevant point uh, <laughs> uh, now is a uh, personal preference. <laughs> to <laughs> I didn't absolutely to. hate it. But uh, I definitely liked it a lot less than I, I disliked it more than I liked it by a pretty wide. I, I would go so far as to say I would have uh, not finished it if I was reading it on my own. I was struggling 
to, to I, I thought this was going to be an easy little, like, ah, oh, fun romp through memory lane, 400 pages, but, like, I'll just blow through this because it's going to flow so well. Wrong. Incorrect. I, I started reading this to get a jump on it, and I did not finish it until yesterday because I just kept putting off reading it. It was one of those books where, like, knowing I had to read it, I just didn't read. <laughs> Instead of like, I would literally just play a video game instead of reading it because if I have to read that, I'm not going to read. It's it's one of the reasons I I say it's okay to just just mark a book did not finish, put that, don't read books you don't like because it'll ultimately make you read less. And I can't believe I'm saying that about a book I rated so highly before. Uh, one of our criteria for it too is you dislike it, but you can understand its appeal to others. I can certainly understand its appeal to others because it fucking appealed to me. Yep, but. But you don't want to be taking uh, 20, 2008 Nate's recommendation or opinion on anything. Well, and that's, that's the thing. It, it appeals to a 20-year-old hipster douche, but this was written by a 40-year-old man. Yeah, but he lives in San Francisco, and that takes at least 20 years off of your, uh, your, your person. It certainly right? adds an intensity to the hipster douchery. Sorry, San Francisco. Recommendation strength. <laughs> Two? <laughs> a niche audience? Uh, this, is also a, this is also a two. Yeah, so I could recommend this to a niche audience that wouldn't care about major flaws. That is our definition of a two. Now, here's the thing. In 2023, so much of this book has aged so poorly that I think on the basis of the racial stereotype humor and the misogynistic humor alone, I, I, I wouldn't want to be associated with this book anymore enough to recommend it. It's why I was cautious about doing it on the podcast in season one and exactly what I was afraid of came true. The the stuff with Minnie Fresh, the fuck puppet stuff, the stuff with Lily, it, it, it all just adds up to too much. And Mrs. Ling, God, Mrs. Ling was actually bothering me by the end. Yeah. Yeah. What a fucking bummer. Just what yeah, a, no, what no. a fucking bummer. But this is the thing. Like I said at the beginning, uh, we deserve it. Yeah. We've been doing this to other people for a long time now. <laughs> so how what did you get, Ben? I think you scored it 40, and I scored it 44. 40 out of 100. Yeah, yep. I, I dropped by almost half. <laughs> yep, I dropped by exactly half. I went from four to two. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, it's... Uh, I want to go back. I, I kind of want to go back. Now, okay, so we did say something, and I don't know if we want to stick to it. Okay. We were wondering if it is a case of maybe we've all grown as people. Maybe society has taught us better. Maybe Christopher Moore wouldn't write this book in 2023. So he writes a lot of books. We could read one he's written more recently. Noir could is s- the most recent non-sequel. I think that was 2018. What is it? Noir. Noir. Okay. Yeah. The, 2018 the or detective. 2019. Yeah. Would you like to do that? Would you still like to give that a shot? Uh, I kind of do, actually. I think in the spirit of words about books, I, I think we should. Yeah, give him a, give him a not, fair shot. Not, like right, not like right now. <laughs> G- give me... What's up next? Battle Royal? Yeah. That should cleanse the old palate. Yeah, I hate it already, Ben. Do you really? I, I fucking hate it, yes. Why? Oh my god, Ben, we're gonna, you know what, you can cut this part, but I am going to make you do something that properly simulates the first few chapters of that book, okay? Oh, just like read all all of the stuff about all your No, I'm gonna make you watch a wrestling battle royale, and I'm going to explain who all the characters are in detail, (laughs) and then I want you to fucking tell me, like, I'm gonna show you a picture and be like, now who was that? (laughs) You can use that in the episode proper when we get to it. Are you at all? Uh, are you at all struggling with the with the Japanese names? Uh, I'm picking up some of them. The problem isn't the Japanese names; it's the problem of they're saying twenty of them in a row. Yeah, like forty main characters. Yeah, they're <laughs> like, okay, this is uh, class member number twenty, Kese Kujunaki, or whatever, and this is female classmate number twenty. Uh, blah 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 blah, and then. 21 and then 21 and then 20 it's like oh my well don't worry it gets easier to remember them as the book goes on because there's fewer yes 
Yeah. It's like a chess game. A lot of moves at the beginning. A lot of things that you got to consider. But as you trade out the pieces, it all gets a little simpler. Yeah, but first we're going to read some Paul Tremblay. And I'm actually looking forward to that because look at the shit that we've had to read lately. It can't be bad, right? It can't. It just can't. can't. This is the cabin at the end of the woods, right? Yeah, I don't think that's exactly what it's called, but yeah. Or the cabin at the end of the world or something. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's what we're going to do. So we're ending the episode now, right? Yeah. Or the episode. Shout outs. uh, That was an experience. Uh, Thank you again, patrons. You sure do know how to pick them. Okay. (laughs) Speaking of those patrons, uh, I would like to do the Patreon shout outs. We have. I'm going to go with Jamie first this time. Oh, sorry. Spooky Shy flicked me off. I guess. uh, Still going with Jamie first. So, Jamie, of If You Want the Gravy. (laughs) She's out of me. Jamie, of If You Want the Gravy uh, blog. Uh, Jamie reviews mostly movies, but recently, for me, he reviewed a serial. And I'm going to go buy that cereal. And I think you all should check out that review. We then have Spooky Shy. Uh, They are doing stuff over on TikTok. That is Shy with a Y, spelled C-H-Y. We have Isekai Sensei-sama, who I'm not going to butcher at this time, is podcasting (laughs) over at the... That time, I was reincarnated as an anime podcaster. Podcast. Uh, incorrect. In the same world! Fuck! (laughs) And it's, I got reincarnated, I believe. Um, God. Okay, look, if if you can find it, I'll put a link in the description. That time I got reincarnated in the same world as an anime podcaster. You got the words out of order, too? It's a scavenger hunt. It's a scavenger hunt. Find (laughs) his podcast. (laughs) It's a scavenger hunt. Find his podcast. But I know you can definitely uh, do worse than starting at animepodcasterreincarnation.com. I remembered that. Yeah, there you Uh, go. Because I write for it. (laughs) But... uh, uh, Oh God! Then we have John Beers. John Beers, who uh, should not be our patron, but he is. John Beers is, of course, a famous author, author of the Mage Errant series, The Rack, and a new book coming out soon. He is over on Patreon as well, and you can become his patron and check out some of his short stories. You get to vote on them. You get to read them before anyone else. It's pretty cool. If you should happen to want to talk to us outside of the podcast, we are on Twitter occasionally at WAB Pod. We are on Instagram at Words About Books Podcast. You can email us at Words About Books Pod at gmail.com and join our Discord. We got a block of blog at Words About Books Ninja. Google us. I think I think we're I think we turn up in the search results these days. Just Google Words About Books. It's all there. Links are in the description. All, All right. right. <laughs> Flawless. Flawless. Perfect. Alrighty, that's why you're working now? Yeah, what's up? What do you want from sheets? Uh, just give me a T. Okay. Uh, right, well, where are you going to? I'm just going to get a pizza. You need a pizza? Cheese sticks. Cheese sticks. Cheese sticks. Cheese sticks. Cheese sticks.